Hey, what's up guys? My name is Jenna. Welcome back to my Game Engine series. So last time we planned an event system for Hazel. If you haven't seen that video, make sure that you check it out. I know it's a planning video, I know you might think that it's kind of boring and it's let's just write some code. Sure, but it's really important that you understand why we're making these kind of architectural de decisions that we actually are making. Because if you don't understand that, then well, you're not going to be able to learn how to actually write a game engine, which is what the series is all about. So definitely make sure you check that out. The second thing is, I want to just give a huge thank you to all the patrons that make this series possible. If you guys aren't supporting the series, you can go to patreon.com forward slash the churno. You'll get episodes like a week early, as well as access to the source code of the Hazel engine as fast as I can write it. So, I mean, I mean, we've already got like a window and like colors on the screen and all of that stuff already working correctly kind of in that development branch. So um, if you want to kind of just search ahead or see where this is heading or just, you know, get some, get your hands on actual code that is way more kind of further along than what we're actually doing in these videos, that's definitely the best place to do that. So speaking of which, um, because we're kind of getting into large systems, I thought that I would kind of change the format of this series a little bit. And this is kind of the first episode in which we kind of see this this um, this change that, that is happening. So in previous episodes, what I would do is I would kind of just write code in front of you. And I, and I still will do that to an extent, but that part is actually going to change because this event system is a considerable amount of code. And these videos, which I originally wanted to keep between kind of 10 to, 50, 10 to 20 minutes are kind of becoming 20 to 30 minutes and I mean, even 30 plus some episodes, um, which is a little bit too much. I want this series to be a little bit more accessible, a little bit more consumable. Um, and I guess more so about the actual decisions and how the code works rather than actually physically writing out the code in front of you. Now, I might, I might make a video on why I made this decision and we can talk about it maybe in another video. I don't want to really just ruin this event video by talking about all that kind of stuff. But what's going to change now and probably going forward is that instead, what I've done is I've taken code from that private development branch, code that I've already written, code that I've already tested, code that I've been probably using for a while at this point, and I've kind of merged it into this Hazel public repository. And then what I'm going to effectively do is explain how all of it works, of course, um, and also kind of go through the diff of before and after the last episode. Now, because this is pushed to GitHub, you can actually look at the diff yourself eventually if you want to once this video goes public. But even in the video, I'll kind of go through each change and explain what's actually happened and not just kind of why I've done this, but also how it works. So I think that ultimately, I mean, in terms of learning, it should be exactly the same. It's just, just going to save a lot of me typing out stuff that doesn't necessarily need to be typed out in front of you. Um, and I can even talk about some of the reasons why, like some of the different, different things that I thought about while writing this code as well, because this code is all 100% written by me. So of course, I know exactly why I've decided to do certain things. Um, and not other things. Anyway, without further ado, let's just jump in and take a look at this event system. Although, also, I have a few amendments from the pre-make video, I believe, um, that we'll also cover here. But hopefully this new format um, is also kind of entertaining for you guys to watch as well. I think it actually might be easier to watch because instead of just waiting for me to write out code, it's more, more of the episode is spent on me actually explaining the code and talking about the actual code rather than physically typing it out. So anyway, let's just jump in and take a look. So here is the event, uh, file, I'll kind of go through what I've actually added um, so that you guys can see. Um, essentially, what I've done is I've created this folder called events inside the Hazel directory. Um, and there's four files in here. There's the event.h header file, which is kind of the main file um, for this whole event system. And then we've got different types of events kind of split up into their own files. So we'll kind of go through how these work first, and then we'll take a look at an example of actually creating an event just to see what the API kind of looks like and what we can actually do with it. Um, Okay, so let's just start with the with the top, I guess. This file is completely new, so there's no need to show like a diff or anything because it's 100% new. Um, so the first thing I wanna kind of talk about are these includes because these are something that I really don't like including into um, files like this because string and also functional are just kind of C++ standard library stuff that first of all should really probably be in a pre-compiled header, but even above that, they should just be kind of included maybe in core. So one thing that we need to get to doing very, very quickly, um, because it's just gonna be, the, the further along this engine gets, the harder it's gonna be to, in to integrate later is pre-compiled headers. So we might take a look at that maybe in the next episode or sometime soon in the future. Okay, so I've written a nice little comment here just to explain how the event system currently works. And basically this just says that it's blocking, right? Which means that 
the way that this is designed right now is that it's not buffered. It's not kind of, events aren't deferred. As soon as they actually happen, like as soon as the mouse is clicked, that's it. The whole application basically stops and then processes that event. It's not kind of just like, let's get the information from the event, push it into some kind of queue or some kind of buffer, and then kind of defer it until, until we actually go through the event, you know, pass or whatever, um, or kind of you know, propagate it through like some kind of event bus or something. Um, no, it just happens immediately. So this is just a little comment explaining that how the design currently works and maybe in the future we can buffer them into some kind of event bus. Okay, cool. So this is kind of the heart of everything. So we have this event class, um, but we also have an enum, which basically an, an enum class, which describes the event type, right? So we have different kind of event types. I've kind of split them up into separate lines. Some of them we might not even use. We can explore using them. For example, these ones, I'm not 100% convinced that I actually want to use, but everything else is uh, totally fine. And you can also see that because this code is, is code that I've already written and because it's kind of written in the Hazel development branch, I'm able to actually, like I totally forgot about mouse scrolling, for example. And if I made this video, I might have just forgotten about that, that and had to add it later. But because I've kind of um, gone through and been using this code for a while, it's kind of matured, I guess, to the point where the, the code that I can merge in here and show you guys is actually somewhat, you know, final. I mean, obviously we'll tweak it in the future. Um, as need be, but it's a little bit more mature than me just kind of writing what's off the top of my head or based on some loose design that hasn't been through like, you know, actual usage like this code has because I've been using this code quite a bit in that Hazel development branch. Anyway, um, so we have different kinds of event types. We've got all the window events. Now these actual events are implemented in their relevant kind of uh, files. So application event kind of covers all of these. Key events covers key pressed and released, and then mouse events cover all this stuff. So if we take a look at application event, for example, you can see we have that like window resize event. I don't think I've act, yeah, okay. App render, app update, app tick, window close, and all that stuff, it's all kind of implemented here. And we'll take a look at that later. Um, so this enum basically is just like, hey, you know, what is, we have a code assigned to each event. You can see it's like a number essentially from like, you know, none is zero, but from one to like 14. Um, and this basically just says, this is what type I am. And we'll need that in the future because we need to be able to kind of tell which type an event is. Um, and you know, we don't, we obviously don't want to use something like dynamic cast or runtime type information for something as trivial as this. It's easier just to have an int ID kind of associated with everything and then we can deal with it. Okay. So event categories. The reason we have these, um, is because we basically may want to filter certain events. So in other words, I am receiving all events from my application into some kind of on event class, but I only care about the keyboard events, right? Or for like, here's a really simple scenario. I, w I would like to log every keyboard event now, um, or every mouse event, let's just say mouse event, cause there's more of them, right? So do I really have to go and check to see if the event type is pressed or released or moved or scrolled? That's a little bit annoying. So instead, what I can do is I can just say, hey, you know what, just give me all of the mouse events. And because we have kind of this um, event category enum, uh, we're able to do that because it's kind of like a, it's almost like a, um, a trait, I guess, that's applied to certain event types so that we can actually uh, see what they are. Now, this is a bit, uh, a bit field essentially. Um, if we just go to this, cause I've just kind of defined it in the core.h file. Um, this is all it is right? Define bit X as just one shifted by X places. This just says that if you do bit one, for example, you'll have essentially just a bit at position, you know, one, um, zero would be position zero and so on and so forth. Um, so that we can actually end up with a bit field, right? Um, the reason we want that specifically and not just zero, one, two, three, four is because we have the ability for an event to belong to multiple categories. So for example, you know, keyboard mouse and mouse button events are all input events. A mouse button event is a mouse event right? A keyboard event is a keyboard and an input event. So we have kind of, we want to apply multiple categories to a single event type. So we need to create a bit field so that we can have multiple bits set. And then we can simply just mask them out and see what, uh, what kind of category an event or what categories an event actually belongs to. Um, don't worry about these macros for a second. We'll get to them. Um, let's just, uh, take a look at this actual event class. Okay. So first of all, I just want to give a quick, um, pause. You see how, how nice this is? Like, this is my first time doing a video in this format, but imagine if I had to write out all this code, this video would be like an hour long. So I think that this is actually a lot better. And I might not even have mentioned a lot of the stuff I did just because I would be, you know, stretched for time. So, um, 
yeah, just wanted to make a quick comment that I'm actually enjoying this. Okay, anyway, so we have um, this event class, um, which uh, we'll talk about the event dispatcher later as well. But essentially, this is a base class for events. Um, the other thing this actually stores is a handled Boolean, um, because we need to be able to see if an event has been handled or not. The reason we have that is because further down, um, the, the line when we actually start to dispatch events to, to various layers, for example, um, it's pretty common for us to uh, decide to say that I don't want this to be propagated any further. So a mouse click event, for example, if we have a button on our screen and we've clicked the mouse and the, the mouse has fallen within the bounds of the button, then that's it. That event has kind of been handled. We want it to consume that event so that the layer underneath it, which might be our game world, doesn't actually receive a click event because, of course, it's already been handled by the button. Um, so that's why we need this here. And of course, in the future, when we actually get around to this, you'll see real examples of this in use. Um, is in category is a very simple kind of utility function, which basically just asks, hey, you know, is this, um, you know, is this kind of, is this event, for example, you know, a mouse event or whatever, is it in the given category? And we can just use this quickly to filter out certain events. And all it does is just an and with the actual category to see if it actually belongs to that category or not. Um, of course, this will, if this returns zero, it means that it's not in the category at all. Um, if it returns anything other than zero, it'll be cut, it'll be true, right? Which means that it is at least in that category. It might be in other categories as well, but it's at least in this one. Then we have a bunch of virtual functions, some of them being pure virtual, which means they must be implemented. So such as get event type, get name, get category flags. Now, I haven't decided whether or not I actually want category flags to be a debug only thing. Name definitely probably like will be. Um, it's probably not the biggest overhead to have, but still we, cause it's just a const chart pointer. So it'll be like a pointer to constant, um, you know, kind of read only memory anyway, but something to think about. Um, at the moment, I've left it obviously enabled for all configurations, um, but it's this should really only be used for debugging. I don't, I don't expect ever being, having the necessity to actually retrieve an event name. Um, so yes, but anyway, they're pure virtual, which means every event has to implement them. Um, to string by default just returns the name of the event. Obviously, if you have more details that you want to be able to print, such as, you know, I don't know, let's go to a random event, um, a window resize event, you might want to print, you know, width and height, like I've done here, then you can override that two string function and actually say that, okay, this is a window resize event and I'm including this information with it. Okay. Um, because I've kind of, you know, this, the two string is definitely a debugging only thing. I haven't been really kind of uh, attentive to performance or anything like that. I'm just using string stream here. Not that string stream is terrible for performance, but obviously it has the ability to allocate memory. Um, but again, we don't care about performance here at all because all this is, um, is a debug only kind of, hey, print the event information because I'm not sure my events are working correctly or whatever, right? Should never be used by actual game runtime for anything other than debugging. Okay, cool. Um, moving on. Uh, so yeah, so these have to be implemented. This by default, you know, it, it the event class provides you with just a default kind of two string, which is just the name of the event. But of course you have the ability to override that. That's it, that's the whole event uh, class. So before we get into um, the dispatcher, let's just actually look at what an event might look like. So I think I might, um, maybe like a key event would be something better to look at. So. A key event is very simple. Obviously key events work when we kind of press things on our keyboard. So if I press a key on my keyboard, um, that's a key press event. When I release a key from my keyboard, that's a key released event. Now these, these key events have certain things in common, right? Namely the key code of what has been pressed or released, right? Whether it's pressed or released, um, that should be its own event type, but the key code is, is common between those events, which is why I've made a base class called key event, which contains the key code. Now, key released probably shouldn't need anything else apart from just the fact that it's a key released event, therefore the key has been released. But a key pressed should also have whether or not the key is a repeated event. What that means is that when I press a key, what happens usually, depending on the operating system and the drivers and all of that, but usually, when I press a key, it sends, the operating system sends a key pressed event, right? And then waits like a little bit and then sends a bunch of key repeat events. 
You can see this in action. If I just kind of click somewhere and I press the A key, you'll see that there's going, and I'm gonna press and hold the A key in a minute here. You'll see there's like, it'll, the letter A will appear immediately, then there'll be a pause, and then it'll print a bunch of them, right? So, yeah, do that again. A, and then there, there are the rest, right? So the first one is a key pressed event, and then the other ones are essentially key repeat events. Um, so we want to be able to kind of also facilitate that. So that's how a pressed event might be different from a released event other than the name. Um, but because they have that key code in common, what I've actually done here is I've created this kind of key event base class, as you can see, which just contains a key code, that's it. Um, it's also got a protected constructor because nothing else can construct it. Um, and then it's got a, just a getter for that key code. Obviously we don't need to set the key code um, because that happens when the event gets constructed, but we do wanna get it. And then we have a macro which implements this class category thing. We will talk about the macros in a minute because there's more. Okay, so a key pressed event. So essentially this is kind of like an abstract event. You shouldn't really be able to make a key event. You really can't. I mean, it's got a protected constructor, so you won't be able to make this class um, in anything other than a class that derives from it. So key pressed event is an actual event, right? That we'll see in our engine. Um, it's basically got a key code and a repeat count. So I haven't really decided whether or not we want to keep track of the amount of times that a key has been repeated. Usually like, essentially like this could act like a Boolean. So, um, you know, I mean, if this is zero, then it has not been, it's not a repeat event. It's the first time that key has been pressed. Um, but then the kind of remaining, like if it's anything other than and other than the zero, which might be one, if it's been repeated or like 20, if it's been repeated 20 times, or it could just be one, even if it has been repeated 20 times, depending on how we implement it. Um, that just means it's a repeat event. So that's really, like this whole key repeat event stuff is really, really useful because if, you know, if you're making something like a menu in a game, so you have like four options in your menu and the mouse isn't in use, for example, you just wanna use the arrow keys to go down the menu. Um, obviously like, you know, for, as an example, you might want to only, you might want to force the user to actually press the, the arrow key multiple times to go through something instead of being able to press and hold it. Um, traditionally, if you just handle a pressed event and you say that until it's released, go cycle through the menu options, that'll keep looping really quickly. And even if the user presses the key quickly, it might actually still send two events. That's bad. Um, because the way that this is set up is as you saw with me typing the A key, it will kind of just send the event, wait a bit, and then send a bunch of repeat events because that's how most operating systems handle this. You could just, you don't, you don't even need to worry about repeat count for menus because you could just say that, you know, obviously there's that gap. Um, so you can just kind of, uh, you can just kind of wait naturally until it kind of, that will give the user enough time to release it if they don't want to go through multiple menu options. And then essentially you could just say that I'll just let it naturally work, which means that if the user presses the down arrow, it goes down, waits a bit, and then it goes boom, 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 um, all the way down and maybe loops or whatever. So that's just a use case scenario. Anyway, um, that's kind of the idea with repeats. Uh, we've implemented a toString function here, which overrides our toString, and just essentially says that um, this will just print which key code has been pressed and also the amount of times. And then we have this event class type macro, which implements all of our functions. So let's talk about these macros now. We have event class category and event class type. The reason these exist is because we need these three things implemented. Now, event type, name and category flags are so trivial that, I mean, we don't really need them. Now, category flags obviously does need the category to be specified, but name and event type, I mean, the name is the event type and it's just a pain to kind of type all this. So instead of us having to type essentially all of this code, I'll, I would, I'll show you what it would look like. If we go to key event, you know, if I wanted to implement this stuff, I'd have to basically say, um, I mean, look at all this stuff. Uh, we also need a static type, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but basically what I would need to say is that I, I would need a static function which returns the type of this event. Now this is a key pressed event, which if we go to our event class, it's this key pressed event, which would just be event type key pressed. I need to have a virtual function which returns this static type and we'll see why we need that in a minute. Um, and then I would need this name, which again, would probably be something like that. So instead of copying and pasting this code in every single implementation, 
I've just implemented a macro that I can use, which just says event class type and then key pressed, which is this type and that's it. And then obviously what it will do is fill in the blanks. It will stringify it for the name. Um, and I mean, that's about it. So that being said, what is the idea with these static types? Why do we need them? Well, we want to be able to at runtime check to see which type this key pressed event is. Right? So obviously we need a function that returns which event type it is. Now, this does not have to be a member function. It can just be a static function because if we say key pressed event type or whatever, um, we don't need to have an instance of the key pressed event class to actually see what type it is. Obviously key pressed event is always going to be a key pressed event, no matter what the instance is. Now, the reason we need a non-instance based one, specifically a virtual one, right? This overrides a virtual uh, function. The reason we need that is because if we just have an event base class, right? If we're just treating it kind of, this is like a polymorphic kind of thing, where just, we just have a reference or a pointer to an event, we want to be able to see what type it actually is. So we can do event, you know, get event type, and it will return which event type it actually is. Um, one implementation scenario for this is the actual event dispatcher. You can see what it does here in the dispatch function is it checks to see which event type the current event that we're trying to dispatch is, whether or not it matches this template argument. And because this is a static function, we can just do t colon colon get static type. Now there's no type safety here to make sure it's an event, for example. But um, ignoring, but, but that aside, you can see that obviously, because uh, it just won't compile if this isn't an event. Um, or, or anything that has get static type. But anyway, you can see here, we're able to do this comparison between an event reference, which is just, which could be any event, um, and this template argument. And then if so, for example, in this case, this dispatcher will dispatch it to the appropriate um, event or to, to the appropriate function essentially. And we'll talk about the event dispatcher in more detail a little bit later. But anyway, that's why we need these two. Um, and then the, the get name, you know, just returns the name for usually for debugging purposes. So all of these three are easily implemented with this one macro. Um, same with event class category. Instead of us kind of having to, you know, type out, um, you know, virtual int get category flags, const override, whatever, we can easily just say event class category, these two. Okay, I've ordered them together because of course a keyboard event is also an input event. Okay, um, and I've implemented this in the base class because a key press and release event are both of these anyway, so I don't need to implement them in their own kind of um, classes. Okay, that's the key press event. Key release event is identical except it doesn't, does not have that repeat count. Um, and obviously it's just got a key released event and the type is key released instead of key pressed. Okay, that is, um, that is the key event. Now mouse events, exactly the same. I mean, you, you guys probably already understand how to write these. Um, a mouse moved event, okay, is an event. Um, it's got X and Y, which is the location of the mouse as it currently stands. We've got getters for that. We've got a two string, which prints mouse moved event along with the coordinates. And then we've, impl we've implemented these two things, which implement the mouse moved class type, which gives us all of our type information. And then also, um, event class category, which tells us which category it's in, and that's it. And then we're storing everything here. Um, quick note for the Hazel kind of engine, the coding style that I've kind of adopted is um, public stuff first and then private stuff. The reason is when you kind of look at a class and you know, let's just say you're writing a game with the Hazel engine and you wanna quickly see what you can actually do with the API. Um, obviously you don't care about the implementation details, which are private, right? Um, what you want to see first is what you can actually use, right? Um, so that's why it makes more sense to me to just say all the public stuff gets written first and then the private kind of stuff that is only in, that is only kind of interesting to us as developers, as, de as people developing the Hazel engine, um, you know, that's kind of, let's just not talk about that because if we're actually using the Hazel engine, we want to actually see what we can use and not implementation details, which we don't care about. Okay, scroll event, exactly the same, right? We have our offset, which is essentially um, where we've kind of scrolled, um, both X and Y, because there is horizontal scrolling that we can do on some mice. Um, and then uh, this obviously prints um, all of the information, implements uh, all the type stuff as well. Button event, again, you know, this is an actual base class, and then we have button press, button released. 
Um, we have our button being stored here. This is protected so that we can't create this event. Only um, the mouse button pressed event and release event can create that. And then we have um, everything else implemented kind of as usual, you get the drift. Um, application event has things like window resize, window close event. Window close event is really simple, has absolutely nothing. Um, it's in the application event category. Um, and uh, all it really is, is just, hey, I'm a window close event. It doesn't need any data at all. Um, resize event has the width and height that we've been resized to. Um, and then we have also these three events, which I'm not 100% sure if I'm gonna use yet, but we have tick event, update event, and render event. Um, this is if we would like our kind of, you know, update, render, and tick functions to actually be propagated as events, um, which is doable, but uh, again, if we were trying to be really like pedantic about our correct kind of event system usage, then maybe everything should be an event and thus, you know, thus we should have this implemented as an event, but because they're kind of, you know, so so intrinsic to an actual application, um, I feel that maybe this should just be hard coded as just like, you know, these three are like, you know, actual non-modular events. They're always present um, and you can choose to implement them or you don't have to, but they're kind of already there for you. You don't need to first receive them as an event and then dispatch them to a function. They're already called and I'm, th I'm leaning towards doing it that way, but just in case we do have these three events over here. Okay, so that is that. Um, that's what I've actually added, these kind of four, four files, which are essentially a full event system. Um, oh, the dispatcher, let's quickly talk about that. So the dispatcher is a, is a way for us to actually dispatch events based on their type really easily. Okay, so if, we're, if we receive an event and we, you know, our on event function gets called, we will, we will be receiving it as an event reference, which means that it could be any type of event. We have no idea what it is. So what we can do is we can actually write, we can create an, an instance of this class with the event that we've just received. And then we can call this dispatch function a bunch of times with, with a different event function. Now this event function is, as you can see, it's, an, it's a standard function all right, which returns bool and takes in t reference. So t in this case could be any event type, like window resize event. So we could say bool dispatch, you know, window resize event, um, and then we could implement a function somewhere in our engine, um, usually in the same class as you've actually are handling this, this event in, but essentially a function that takes in, you know, um, a window resize event and then returns a boolean. Um, and then you just basically pass this through and if the event that you're trying to dispatch matches the type of this function, essentially, um, then it will actually run that function. It'll call that function with that event. Otherwise, it just won't, right? Um, that's really it. It's really easy to use. Um, we'll see it in action probably in the future when we actually start you know, receiving events from like the window class or whatever. Um, but that's kind of just a really easy way for us to actually be able to um, not have to say, you know, manually now on event function, if the event type is key event, call the key pressed, you know, on key pressed function with the, and you know, and also cast this to a, you know, to the, to a key pressed event, because it's currently just a normal base event. Um, this kind of automates that and makes our code in the client side look really, really simple. And then finally, we have a little output stream operator. This exists for our logging library so that we can easily just call to string on the event um, and we'll be able to log events really easily as we'll see in a minute. Okay, so that's all of the new files that I've added. Um, I'm going to take you through the diff of the kind of existing files that I've modified. I've set up a very, very simple example of this event system. Feel free to just play around with it and make your own examples or just, you know, play, just play around with it so that you can understand how it works a little bit better. Obviously, as we add like a window class and we actually start receiving these real events, like real input events, we'll be heavily using this system. But for now, it's kind of just there for us to use. Um, so yeah, let's just take a look at all the diffs. So I'm using beyond compare here. Um, I've really just run gif diff tool and I've set up beyond compare as my diff tool um, and I've done a full directory diff. Um, so this is everything that's changed. Um, so let's take a look. So a few, thing, a few things that I did um, in the pre-make file is from the last episode, um, you, might, you might have realized that I added, I added a little note. This wasn't in the last episode, this was in the pre-make episode. 
Um, but I added a little note saying that we don't actually have to hard code this. Um, there is a system version latest now in Premake that we can just use and that will just use the latest system version. So that's what we want. So I've changed that for both um, the Sandbox and the Hazel projects. And then I've also added um, into the include directories for Hazel, I've also added the source directory. This is just so that we can, you know, do stuff like, because, you know, this event is inside the events folder, um, this event.h file, but I, I don't really want to go back a directory and go into core or whatever. I want to be able to just start from the source directory and always do my paths kind of relative to that source directory, which contains Hazel. So if we look at all, all files here, you can see we have a source directory. The fact that I've added this source directory here means that everything's everything can be relative to this, which means I can just write Hazel core like that. And it's really clean. And it also means that if this file moves into a different folder, I don't have to redo all my paths. Um, everything's going to be always relative to this. Okay, so that's all the changes that I've made to um, the premake file. Obviously, I have ran the generate projects batch file and I've actually regenerated all of these projects, which means that that's why these two have changed. Um, so yeah, okay, application. Um, so I've included events here. Um, probably didn't need to do it necessarily in the application file, in the, in the header file, it could be done in the CPP file. But all I've really done here is just, um, and we'll run this code in a minute, but I've just created a little test. I've created a window resize event like that, and then I've just logged it using HZ trace. And because we've added those output stream operators, we should just be able to do that. Um, okay, cool. And then in core.h, I added that bit um, macro just so that we can uh, define bit fields easily. And then into our logging system, I've added this include, which is the output stream operator for SPD log, for speed log, so that we can actually um, use our kind of custom, so, so that we can log custom types like our events. Okay, that's it. That's all that's changed. So um, to do a little test here, what I've done is, again, I've got this window resize event, just creates a window resize event, and then we just log it. If I run this code, you can see that um, I get my window resize event being logged correctly and everything is great. Um, if I do something else, uh, you know, I could, for example, say, you know, is this in the, is in category, um, I don't know, application, um, then we could trace it. Otherwise, you know, if it's in, let's just try a category that it's not in, um, event class, event category, input. Um, so this should only log it once, right? And I can put a breakpoint here just to verify what actually happens. So you can see it is in that category. So we, we actually log it and it's not in this category. So we skip it. And in the end, it gets logged once. Okay. So that's kind of the idea. Um, it's really quite simple. Um, and we've got a very basic test, obviously, as we start to implement a window class, which is probably going to be our next major thing. Um, after maybe some other things like pre-compiled headers, um, we'll actually start using this event system properly and you'll see it fully in action. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Let me know what you think of this new format. I really like it. This ended up being over 30 minutes anyway. Imagine if I'd written all this code, it would probably be an hour, I'd probably be really boring and I'm just, I'm really happy. And it, this just makes it easier for me as well because instead of concentrating and making sure that I'm not forgetting anything and typing the right code again, um, I'm less stressed about that and I'm actually, I can actually spend more time explaining um, what the code actually does. And like, to me, that's more fun and possibly more useful to you guys. Let me know if you notice um, any differences in kind of how this goes um, and the information you're getting out of this. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, you can hit that like button. Um, you can help support the series by going to patreon.com forward slash the channel. As I said earlier, you will get access to that private repository in which we already have a window class. I just hit the microphone, I'm sorry. Um, in which we already have the window class as well as all of these events being used. Um, so if you want to see this event system in action like today, you can just go and help support the series. Um, and obviously it does help actually support this series. So you'll see more episodes and it's just a good little community we have, um, which makes this series possible, which is awesome because I love making these videos for you guys. Um, next time I really want to do pre-compiled headers. Um, and then after that, I think we'll probably finally be able to start talking about how we can implement a window class because getting something on the screen would be quite nice. I'm really happy we have this event system. One thing that I just remembered that I didn't talk about is, and it, which, which will probably be more or less tied with the window class is going to be an input system. So we have the ability to be notified about input events, but we can't actually ask as to what the current state 
of like a key on our keyboard is. That's gonna be important as well because whilst receiving events are great, it's also really nice to be able to say, hey, you know, is the left mouse button currently pressed? We can't actually do this with the system. What we could do is receive a mouse event and then store that event until we get a mouse released event. Um, and then that way, you, can, you know, we could see if the mouse button's pressed. But instead of doing that on the client side, I'd like to move that into Hazel and just have it as something that, that, the, that the API can do. So we will kind of revisit input events in the future to support that. Um, but again, that's not an event system thing. That's just a, that's just like an input state, input manager kind of thing. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this video. I will see you next time. Goodbye.